I want to thank all of you up alongside the walls there for your standing ovation. It is greatly, greatly appreciated. And after that introduction, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. Uh, Governor Hogan, I want to thank you for that kind and very generous introduction and for reading it just like I wrote it last night. <laughs> but thank you even more, sir, for the sincerity of your hospitality and for hosting this event. Uh, I appreciate, and I want to make sure I'm real clear with this, the sincerity of your leadership. It has been straightforward. <laughs> It has been straightforward and honest. Two values that are very much appreciated in an era of uncontrolled tweeting and political posture. <laughs> and I thank you for hosting all of us who are here today. And my sincere thanks also to our Lieutenant Governor, Boyd Rutherford. For <laughs> for his genuine willingness to listen to Marylanders all across the state who have different opinions and different backgrounds, and for always being a gentleman in doing so. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when you get to be my age, you think back and you wonder why you hadn't met people earlier and gotten to know the best of them. And then sometimes it's because some of the best are saved for last. So it's been a pleasure getting to know you and working with you and having an opportunity also to thank you along with the governor for this invitation today. Madam First Lady, thank you very much for being here. I do appreciate it. How long it takes. I want to say hello, if I can, to Mayor Grant, who's here. I want to thank members of the Morgan State University Board of Regents, Regents who are here, our Vice Chair, Regent Tony Draper, uh, Regents uh, Winston Wilkinson, and Regent Tracy Parker Warren. I didn't expect any of them to be here, but I'm glad to see all of them. And I'm glad for all of you in the house who are Morgan graduates. You know, we just got finished celebrating our sesquicentennial, 150 years of existence. <laughs> Born four years after Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and have been working to educate students ever since. Uh, it was good to hear the Lieutenant Governor call the name of Henrietta Lacks who I remember from my days at Turner Station, whose family, particularly Sonny and others, I had an opportunity to grow up with, and who, along with my mother, knew each other way, way, way back when. It's always good to hear Mrs. Black's name called. Governor, you mentioned Verda Welcome. Thank you for that. The first woman state senator in the country. Uh, she and her husband were the reason I ever got involved in politics, sitting in their living room one day and being challenged. And you also mentioned Thurgood Marshall, whose name we ought to call more often, particularly when we talk about our airport. I got to meet uh, Justice Marshall right after I got elected to Congress in, in 86, and he sat me down and reminded me that he and I grew up on Division Street in Baltimore, just a few blocks from one another. Um, I wanna, if I might, say a few things, so bear with me, and again, for those of you who are standing, Thank you for your indulgence. In a speech delivered in 1848 in Edwardsville, Illinois, Abraham Lincoln addressed these words to his countrymen, and I quote. He said, when you have succeeded in dehumanizing the Negro, when you have put him down and made him to be but as the beast of the field, when you have extinguished his soul in this world, and placed him where the ray of hope is blown out, as in the darkness of the damned. Are you quite sure that the demon you have roused will not turn and rend you? What constitutes, he asks, the bulwark of our freedom and of our independence? Lincoln said it is not our crown and battlements. It's not our bristling seacoast, our armies, or our navies. For all those may be turned against us without having made us weaker for the struggle. Our reliance, he said, is in the love of liberty, which God has planted deep within us. Our reliance, he said, is in the spirit of freedom, which prides itself as the heritage of all men 
and all women in all lands everywhere. Destroy that spirit, he admonished, and you have planted the seeds of despotism at your own doorstep. Ignore those chains of bondage and you prepare one day for your own limbs to wear them. A custom, he said, to trample on the rights of others. And you would have lost the creative genius of your own independence. And as such, would become the fit subjects for the first cunning tyrant who rises among you. Lincoln's words uttered 170 years ago in many respects have gone unheeded. As our nation searches for some sense of normalcy in the wake of government shutdowns, unrelenting poverty, and school shootings, and an abandonment of basic values and a pop culture that is out of control. In celebration of the history of African ancestors Americans as we do today, and as people are doing all over this country, let us always keep one thing in front of us. And that is that that history was always made possible by the concept and the powerful belief of hope that tomorrow would be better than today, and that our children would live in a better world than we would live in. And so for a race of people who had suffered, endured, and survived, two centuries of slavery, oppression, deprivation, degradation, denial, and disprivilege, that powerful belief in hope was everything. They didn't have degrees from universities. They couldn't speak the King's English. Their brows were wrinkled with the sweat, and their bodies were bent from the forced labor of the day. But they never stopped hoping, and they never stopped fighting for a future yet unknown. And so they gathered their lot rather than to curse their God. And they laid down their bodies all over America cotton fields of Georgia, peach groves through the South, tobacco fields of Maryland and North Carolina, they laid down and made their bodies bridges that we might run across one day en route to that future. It was the same hope they had later when they saw America through the legal lynchings and the Jim Crow era that stuck with us far too long through the manufactured grandfather clauses and the poll taxes and the literacy tests, where if you were black, you had to tell how many bubbles were in a bar of soap just to be deemed eligible and qualified to vote. It was that hope that caused black people and white people, Jew and Gentile, to join hands and to fight to integrate the military and to abolish official segregation there as we knew it, and then ultimately to give rise to America's great civil rights movement. And so it's not just a matter on this day of having come a long, long way. It begs the question in turn, not when do we get there, but what path do we take? And what grain of hope do we hold together toward a future that is always under construction? Dr. Benjamin Mays of Morehouse College was fond of saying to his students there that he learned one thing from those nameless and faceless people who gave everything they had in years and decades and even in centuries gone by. They all started behind, but Mays would say, you know, he or she who starts behind in the race of life will either have to run faster or forever remain behind. Those who you honor here today in these simplistic but special dedications all ran faster, all of them. Their sacrifice and their achievement reminds us of Gravel when he once said that no daring would be fatal. It reminds us of Sartre when he wrote that the maximum hope would always lie closest to the maximum danger. And it reminds us that Dr. King was right when he said, for the true believers, the darkness would be light enough. So I am here today to join with you, to look at that future, to ponder it, to understand that it's always under construction, to remember as we do on occasions like that, this, that those 
that came before us were anonymous, nameless, faceless people who loved us yet unborn long before we loved ourselves. And to remind you, even in light of all of that struggle, that I have not given up on the American dream or the American possibility. And I ask you not to give up also. I'm convinced that this nation stands before the world as perhaps the last expression of a possibility of mankind devising a social order where justice is the supreme ruler and law is but its instrument, where freedom is the dominant creed and order but its principle, where equity is the common practice and fraternity the true human condition. And it is also my conviction that we, the beneficiaries of the revolution that was televised, may in fact be the last generation of Americans that has the opportunity to help our nation completely fulfill its promise and realize its true and total possibility. Our generation may be the last to be afforded another chance. Another chance for us to balance the scales of justice and to finally make them equal. Another chance for us to confront the doors of opportunity and shake and break them open. Another chance for us to <coughs> seize the chains of mental bondage and break them free. We were taught that the arc of the universe is long, but it always bends towards justice. So I ask that you think about and think on those things that this occasion be both merry and somber at the same time. That we look at one another, really, in this room as inheritors of the same earth, and in many respects, future inheritors of the same future. And that we find a way, whenever we can, to stop, to pause, to remember, and to lift those who came before us. Thank you all very much.